Today's discussion is on natural selection, adaptation, and fitness of organisms. An adaptation is any phenotypic trait or genetic trait that provides an advantage for the organism that carries it. So here's a picture of a frog. It looks like a little bit like a dead leaf, and so it fits right in with the forest floor where it lives. So in the right environment, that's an adaptation. And remember that over time, based on these adaptations, populations can change and evolve, and that's called natural selection. If there's an advantage to flowering early, and there's a range of phenotypes in an organism, in a population of organisms, the ones that flower early will do a little bit better, the population will change generation after generation, and will have a difference from one generation to the next. So, in order to have natural selection, we have to have three different characteristics of a population. And we already know about these, although we haven't maybe talked about them in as much detail. So first, there needs to be variety in a population. There needs to be some difference. And at Darwin's time, he recognized this difference, and he knew that populations varied widely, and there's lots of variability in populations. He didn't understand exactly where all this variation came from. Okay, Number two, whatever variety we're looking at needs to be inherited. So this needs to be able to pass, be passed down from one generation to the next. And again, in Darwin's day, he didn't know exactly how that occurred. Today we know that these are genes and the alleles for those genes that are passed down from one generation to the next. Diversity in a population that is caused by the environment is not inherited. So, for example, in humans, depending on where we are born and who we grow up with, we learn different languages. Those languages become part of our behavior and part of our characteristics. However, the ability to speak a certain language is not programmed into our DNA. So just because you were born from Chinese-speaking parents doesn't mean you'll go up speaking Chinese, and so that's not inherited from one generation to the next. However, the capacity to learn languages is programmed into our DNA, and so that capacity is passed down from one generation to the next. And then finally, there needs to be differential success based on that var variability and uh, it being passed down from one generation to the next. So here's an example we looked at earlier. We have variation at the genetic level that is in both color and toxicity of these ladybugs. It's passed down to their offspring. And then predators learn to stay away from the red ladybugs, which also have a higher level of toxin. And over time, the yellow ladybugs get eaten more frequently. They do less well. The red toxic trait is more adaptive, and so we end up with a change in the population over time. So, in general, this is a very easy question to answer. Levels of variation in natural populations are generally very high. We can see this in our own species. We can see it in other species, too, although it might be a little harder. We might not be able to assess that variability as naturally as we would in the human population. And today we know that all of this variation, all of this differences from one individual to the next, originates as a mutation. So all variation comes from, initially, from mutations. And in sexually reproducing populations, in addition to the raw material that is provided by mutations, we also have a huge amount of diversity and variety mixing and matching that can occur because of meiosis, because of sexual reproduction. And so you can think of sexual reproduction as a source of diversity, but really it has to have something to work with. If everyone is genetically identical, then no matter how much sexual reproduction occurs, we still won't have diversity and variety. We need to have some basic fundamental material to work with to create all of that variety and diversity. Okay, So here's an example. This is an example of a non-genetic trait, right? Holds in your ears. So if you pierce your ears, that doesn't mean that if you then reproduce that you would have offspring that also had pierced ears, no matter how long, long large that hole is, right? So if you put gauges in your ear and make this larger and larger and larger, right, you're not going to have offspring with a comparable size of a hole. That's something that is entirely environmental, and so you don't pass that on. And even if it was an advantage, this is kind of a silly example, right? But if you provided some sort of a, an advantage for carrying things or, you know, you could survive a little bit better or... This is, again, a silly example, but even if it provided an advantage, it wouldn't be natural selection because it's not inherited by the next generation. So, if we look at a population over a range, 
and there's diversity that is induced by that range. So let's say at a high elevation, organisms tend to grow much, much higher, um, uh, much taller. But at a medium elevation, some of the genotypes in the middle grow a little bit taller. And at a low elevation, we get more of a uh, gradient. Then things at the medium elevation, these if tallest plants do best, then this genotype would do best. At a high elevation, this genotype might do best. At a lower elevation, it's also maybe this genotype. And so we could have lots of variety and diversity maintained because we have organisms growing up in different environments where one genotype is better than the other. And so it's really important to remember that the phenotype of an organism is predicted by both its genetic traits, right, genotype, and also by its physical traits, okay? And so what we do is we assign fitness to organisms. So we are going to define a type of fitness that we call relative fitness. And with relative fitness, there are two components that you need to remember. Number one, fitness is determined entirely by the environment that they are living in. So for example, in a area where the ground is dark, the darker coated mice may do better because they can avoid capture by predators more frequently. And so they have a lower frequency of being captured by predators, and so they have the highest fitness. So that's key component number one, is that fitness is entirely determined by the environment. What's good in one, the traits that are good in one area may not be good if they were moved to another area. So over here in the lighter coated air, or lighter substrate where the ground is kind of this tan color, the lighter mice do better and less of them are captured. So that's key number one. Key component number two is that we assign fitness based on the most fit phenotype. So the most fit phenotype gets a fitness level of one, and that's why we call it relative fitness. Everybody else gets a fitness level that's below one. So you can think of one as like 100% the most fit trait. So in this environment, the dark coated individuals would be assigned a fitness level of one. In this environment with a lighter ground, the light coated individuals would be assigned a fitness level of one. And then all other individuals that are different get a fitness level that is below one. If you have a fitness level of zero, that essentially means that you cannot reproduce, you can't pass on your genes. So either you're dead or you're sterile, you have a zero percent chance. But a fitness level between zero and one means you're still doing okay. If you have a 0.9, then you're not quite as good as the most fit phenotype, but you're still doing fairly well, okay? And so scientists do studies. They would measure, they would do observational studies, maybe set out decoys, do experiments, manipulate it, and look how often the light code decoys are attacked compared to the dark coated decoys. They would gather data and do analysis and then they could come up with a measurement of relative fitness levels. And even little tiny fitness advantages can cause a large shift in phenotype in a population over time. However, the speed at which that large shift occurs is going to vary. If you have a massive fitness difference between one part of the population and another part, you might just after one or two generations see a very large shift in phenotype. So we could potentially go from mostly white coated individuals to mostly dark coated individuals if the fitness difference was extreme. If it's only a minor fitness difference, it might take many, many, many generations before we see a large change in phenotype, but it will still happen. And over many generations, we'll have a large shift in phenotype. So here we go, an example where this phenotype is maybe only a slight difference or there's a threshold number of individuals before we get the advantage. And it takes a thousand generations before suddenly we see a large shift and we go from one phenotype to the other one. So here's an example. And don't be tricked. If I show you a picture like this and ask you, is having leaves modified into spines, is that an adaptation? Well, if you're looking at the picture, maybe you've got a little bit more additional information, but if that's the only bit of information you have, if I say leaves modified into spine is an adaptation, your first response should be, I need more information. I need to know something about the environment. And in the right environment, in a hot, arid desert, then that may be a big advantage. So saguaro cactus has many different adaptations, not just leaves modified into spines, that make it do very well and thrive in the deserts of the American Southwest. So those are adaptations. But if we took the same cactus where all these great adaptations and we moved it to a tropical area, suddenly it would not do well at all. It would be competing with other organisms with different phenotypes that are adapted to that environment.
and it would not do well at all. So adaptations are dependent on the environment. And we can test adaptations to determine whether or not they truly are providing advantages for that certain environment. So your book looks at some examples of uh, guppies and the number of offspring that they have. Now, there are basically two extreme strategies and lots of points in between for organisms reproducing. In ecology, we call a strategy where you have very few babies and put lots of resources into those individual babies an R strategy. And humans are an extreme example of an R strategy. We put lots of resources into individual offspring. And for our niche and the way that we live in the environment, that's a very good strategy. The opposite strategy is to have many, many little tiny babies and put very few resources into any one individual offspring. That is called a K strategy. And in some organisms, we see variety and diversity across the species. So in this species of guppies, some individuals have few offspring that are much larger, and some have many, many offspring that are much smaller. And in different environments, those work very, very well. So if you're living in the lower parts of the stream where there are a number of very active, aggressive predators, the best strategy is to have very, very few offspring and put few resources into each of them. However, if you're living in the upper part of the stream, then the best strategy is to have larger offspring. And so these scientists did experiments. And in these experiments, they would move guppies that had adapted to one area of the stream to another area where that trait was no longer an adaptation. And what they saw over time was a shift. And they could shift organisms that had been adapted to having very few babies to organisms that were having much larger babies just by moving them to a new area of the stream. And vice versa, if we took a guppy that had lots of little babies and moved them to an area where it was no longer an advantage to have that type of reproduction, they would shift towards that other form. Now, this only works if there's still genetic variability present in the population. So a few of them are, so notice we see variation in these populations. Not everyone is having the same number of offspring. And so when they get moved, we have a dramatic shift. And sometimes it's as little as two or three generations for that dramatic shift. Now back to this slide. I'd put this here just to remind us we're going to be talking about trade-offs over and over again. We'll see them in many different contexts. A trade-off is when we have to give up one thing for something else. And in evolution, if we give up something that is an advantage, but we give it up for something that's even more of an advantage, then overall that will be a benefit, an adaptation, and it will be selected for. So for instance, ideally you'd have as many babies as possible, and they'd all be large, and put lots of resources into each and, indivi each and every one. But these mothers can't do that without putting their own lives at risk. So the trade-off is, the size of the babies versus the number of babies you have. And we'll talk about trade-offs over and over again. Okay, So again, a reminder, natural selection can be very, very fast if the difference, the fitness difference, is very great. And if that happens within just a couple of generations, we can see dramatic shifts in natural selection. And some species are better at studying the, better for studying this than others. For example, there's been a long-running experiment more than 30 years now in E. coli. E. coli were chosen because they can reproduce so rapidly. You can have several generations of E. coli each day. And not only that, but scientists could save E. coli, put them in the freezer. In a way, it's like almost like having a fossil record, but they're in the freezer instead of stored in the rocks. And so over this long-running experiment, they started multiple replicates of the exact same experiment, where they would take bacteria that had been adapted to live in one sort of a culture media, and they would put them into another culture media. And then they would let them grow for many generations and see what happened over time. And over time, they got progressively better at surviving in this different culture media. Okay, And so those strains were evolving. Now, this is kind of cool because they could run side-by-side -side experiments. They could do 12 different experiments that started with the exact same genetic beginnings, were exposed to the exact same environment, and then look to see if the outcome was the same over all 12 experiments. And here are the results of one of those experiments over 10,000 generations. So notice at the beginning, they were not very good at reproducing. So they're measuring it in two different measures, by relative fitness and by overall cell volume. And so notice that they started out at a fairly low fitness level. But over time, especially at the beginning, they got better very, very quickly. And then they kind of reached this plateau. <coughs> Excuse me. I had to sneeze there.
they reached a plateau where they had kind of maximized the fitness level for living in that area. And when they looked at all of these experiments, go forward there, here's the result of 12 different experiments run identically. So notice that they don't have identical outcomes. Despite starting with the same genetic beginnings and having the exact same environment, they ended up at different areas. Now notice that they all improved. They all got better from where they started, but they didn't all end up in the exact same area. Okay? And if you measured it by cell volume, there's a little bit more of a spread than if you kind of change that to overall fitness. And this shows you a little bit of the kind of trade-off thing. So maybe cell volume is not the only measurement of fitness. But even when we were able to control for just using one measurement of fitness, we still had difference in outcome. So the question is then, why do we have different outcomes? Okay? Now natural selection is fairly predictable particularly if we look at it over long periods of time. But remember that there are unpredictable components of evolution also, especially mutation. And so they started out all genetically identical, but then different mutations occurred that allowed them to do better. Those pushed through so the entire population soon had that new mutation and allowed them to do better. But different mutations occurred in different populations. And so that explains why we had different outcomes. And so this idea of what would happen if we could hit the rewind button, meaning let's just say life on, on Earth, could we think about what would happen if we went back 65 million years to that big mass extinction event that wiped out many of the large reptiles? Remember, the pterosaurs disappeared at that time. All of the ichthyosaurs disappeared. The plesiosaurs disappeared. Some of the big lepidosaurs, those big aquatic mosasaurs disappeared. And most of the dinosaurs. Only a few dinosaurs survived and they are our modern birds. But if we were to hit that rewind button and do it again, would we have the exact same outcome? And the idea is that we would probably see some differences. Now general patterns might remain much the same, but because of randomness and mutation, because of genetic drift, which adds a little bit of randomness also, we would see probably some differential outcomes. So hitting the rewind button on evolution would give us maybe somewhat similar results, but maybe not identical results. Now, we're probably never going to be able to do that. Even if we could hit the rewind button, we wouldn't want to do it. We might wipe out our own species, right? These are kind of sci-fi, and, and a lot of uh, movies or books like to kind of play around with this, what would happen, and we talk about the butterfly effect, where if we made one little change in the past, could it dramatically change our future? We don't really know the answers for that, but we, it's interesting to think about and theorize based on these sorts of experiments that are like a small example of doing evolution the same way over and over and over again. Someday, we might have a little bit more information for this based on our observations from exoplanets. Exoplanets are planets that are outside our own solar system, and we have now identified thousands and thousands of exoplanets. However, our ability to gather data from those planets is very limited because we only know about the data that we can gather through our telescopes. And so we can tell things like how large the planets are, how far away they are from the sun, what type of sun they're orbiting around, and we can even estimate whether or not those planets are in what we would call the Goldilocks zone. The Goldilocks zone, as the name implies, means that it's in an area that's just right. It's not too hot, not too cold, and that means that liquid water can survive on that type of a planet. And we've even identified several dozen planets that have the potential to be somewhat like Earth. Because of the limitations in these observations, these planets that we're able to observe that might be somewhat like Earth are usually a little bit larger than Earth, so gravity would be much larger. We can't as easily see the smaller ones. But someday, as our technology improves, as our ability to record information uh, in the light coming from these planets and from their stars gets better, we might have some information. We might, for instance, be able to tell whether or not there is photosynthesis going on those planets based on the wavelengths of light that we're observing. And if so, then that might tell us something about whether if we have independent origin of life on different planets, if we end up in the same place. But for now, it's still somewhat of a mystery. Okay? So the take-home message is, that when we rerun these experiments, we get somewhat similar outcomes. So harvesting light from the sun might be an inevitable outcome or a very common outcome if we originate life multiple times on different planets. However, the exact mechanisms by which that energy is harvested might be somewhat different. And we won't know for sure until we're able to someday get information about life on other planets, or even if life on other planets exists. There's still a large discussion as to whether or not 
life on Earth is rare, unique even, which seems unlikely. There are hundreds of billions of different galaxies, and each of those galaxies has hundreds of different hundreds of billions of different stars, and from what we can tell, there seem to be planets around nearly every star that we look at. So tens of hundreds of trillions, maybe even more than that, of planets out there. Many of those may have the right conditions for supporting life. If we look and look and look and don't find it, again, we may have the capability to do that within your lifespan, then we might have some more information about this. But for now, it's interesting to speculate. Okay. I'm going to give you a definition, and then we're going to talk about this, and this is an example of a genetic trade-off. Pleiotropy, you need to know what that is. Pleiotropy is where one gene has more than one job. So it has, and some genes have two, three, four, or even more than a dozen different functions. They might function in different tissues. They might function in different uh, metabolic states. They might function at different life stages, okay? But this is a gene with more than one job. And genes that have more than one job tend to be more constrained. So we'll explain exactly what that means. So that's the answer to this question. What are the effects of pleiotropy on natural selection? It tends to constrain it more. And so here's my analogy. Imagine that you're, you are, well, you probably already fit into this, right? So think about you in your day-to-day -day life. You have many calls on your time and um, attention. So you might be a full-time student. You might have a job, you might have family obligations, and those are going to constrain. So your ability to study might sometimes be limited by family obligations or the amount of time you have to work or maybe even you know, extracurricular activities, the amount of time you want to spend playing Fortnite or something like that. Those are all constraints on your time. So if a gene has three or four or five jobs, then changes that might make it better at one of its jobs might not be selected for because it makes the other jobs worse. And so we need to think about it like a trade-off, like a give and take. If a change in a pleiotropic gene provides an advantage, if the disadvantage in the other genes is not too great, if it's not greater than the advantage for the first job, then overall it will be an adaptation will be selected for, even though there's a downside to it. So for instance, you might say, make a decision, say, hey, I'm going to work 20 hours extra this week, and I know that's going to affect my grade, but it's worth it because I need the money. And so you make those decisions in your life all the time. And so natural selection, in a sense, makes decisions about which changes get to be kept if there is an overall trade-off. Okay? And so this term, antagonistic pleiotropy, is a term that allows us to encapsulate that idea. Antagonistic is like a give and a take, a good thing on one side, a bad thing on the other side. And so, for instance, in bacteria, if we had a mutation that allowed them to digest food, a certain type of food better, but it slowed down their reproductive cycle. Well, in, a, in an environment where all sorts of different food are available, that's probably not a good trade-off, so it wouldn't be selected for. But if you're living in an environment where that type of food is the main source of energy, then that's probably a good trade-off. Yeah, you reproduce more slowly, but you can use the resources that are available more effectively, and so it would be selected for over time. So we see here a growth rate, a peak, optimal temperature, this is looking at those trade-offs. And so at higher temperatures, we might have different mutations that are an advantage. So here are some physical examples of something that's similar to antagonistic pleiotropy. We're going to call this a physical constraint, but it's similar. So this is a fun example. Bilaterally symmetrical organisms like yourself or other vertebrates often have paired sensory organs. So eyes are a great example. You have two eyes. And those eyes in humans, like in owls, are very close together in the front of our face. Now that provides great binocular vision, but the trade-off for that is, is we have a very large blind spot. We can't see behind us. Now for the owl, for humans, for many other species, that's been an advantage. And so we've had selected for our eyes to be close together in the front of our face. In other species, it's a better state to have your eyes on either side of your head. This gives you, like in the ostrich, a very wide field of view, nearly 360 degrees. Ostriches only have a very tiny blind spot. But they have very poor binocular vision, because binocular vision comes from the area where both our eyes are overlapping, and that's how we judge distance. And so we think about this in their environments. Why does an owl need binocular vision? And the answer is because they use their eyes, even though they hunt at night, they've got great night vision. They use their eyes to sense where their prey is. 
And if they didn't have good binocular vision, then they would have trouble catching their prey, or they might plow into the ground if they misjudged how far away their prey were. So that's a huge advantage for the owl, and they've given up their uh, field of view. Ostriches, on the other hand, don't really need great binocular vision because they're just herbivores. They eat seeds and plants, and so they don't need to have great binocular vision. They can just look at it, and their plant's not going to run away or try to escape from them. And the eyes on the side of the head allows them to keep an eye out for rivals, for other predators, so they don't need to continually be turning their head all the time to be seeing all the way around them. So that, in the right environment, was a trade-off. So if I ask you, is having eyes in the front of your head, your two eyes close together in the front of your head, is that an adaptation? Your first thought should be, I need more information. If I'm an owl, then yeah, that's an adaptation. But if I'm an ostrich, then it's probably not an adaptation. It's better, the trade-off works so that it's better to have them on the side of the head. Now often, when there is this type of physical constraint or an antagonism where you give up one trait for another trait, Later on, there will be mutations that compensate for that trade-off, that make up for the downside. So owls, for instance, have an incredibly flexible neck. An owl can turn its head more than 180 degrees. So this is an owl from the back here, its tail feathers down here. You can see its spine going up, and it is looking right back at you. So it's turned its head 180 degrees, and it can even go a little bit farther. So while they're perched without having to move around or move their body, they can continually move their head around to see around them. Here's a spider. This is a hunting spider. They jump and grab their prey rather than spinning webs to catch their prey, and the same thing. They have two very well-developed eyes right in the front of their face, and that allows them to judge distance and catch their prey very, very well. Now, they have had a adaptation that's allowed them to overcome the downside of that reduced field of vision, but instead of being able to turn their head, they have different eyes that give them nearly 360 degree vision. So this is another a different but uh, similar result of having a compensation for that trade-off. Now, often there are limits to how well those can go. So, in some mammals, getting to a very large size has been an advantage. The downsides of that are increased uh, pressure on your joints, increased damage, and so they can grow to a certain point, but then are going to have physical constraints on how big they can be. And sometimes secondary and new mutations need to occur to reinforce the joints to add muscle bulk before they can get to a certain size. This is a diagram by Salvador Dali, kind of, uh, he was a surrealist, and he's kind of poking fun or making a statement about that point, that elephants, there's no way an elephant could get this sort of proportions because of those constraints. If they did, all their bones in their legs would break. Elephants just can't grow that tall with those long skinny legs. But at a different scale, you can have those proportions. So at smaller scales, the strains are not so much. And so daddy long legs are even more extreme than that uh, diagram of the skeleton. And so at small scales, there are not as many physical constraints to this uh, proportion of body to, le to, to legs. And in some organisms, we have pushed these features to their extreme. So racehorses, for example, have been pushed to kind of the extreme level of the constraint we've selected for stronger and faster and faster racehorses. And this has put tremendous strains on their legs. Uh, at racetracks, very, very frequently, horses have quite severe extreme injuries. And so they are kind of at the very, very limits the of where that constraint is. Okay. There is limited variability available in populations. And so we cannot think of natural selection as finding the very, very best solution to a problem. Sometimes it does. But other times, it just finds a better solution than what is going on at the present time. So natural selection is not perfect, but it works on the limited variety and diversity that's available and picks things that are better and over time makes them more and more common because of the differences in fitness. Okay. Last vocabulary word, acceptation. Acceptation is a term that is, you can kind of think of it as an adaptation in waiting. So let me give you a definition, and then we will talk about um, So this adaptation in waiting is diversity and variety that is already present in the population. 
and it's not good or bad, or it might even be a little bit bad, but it's not really an advantage at all. It's just diversity that's there, and we can see this all the time, right? So if we look at humans, what's the advantage of having dark colored hair? And maybe even in the past, but certainly today, there's no advantage. So redhead, blonde, brown hair, black hair, it doesn't matter. You know, you, you do equally well no matter what the color of your hair is. And we can look at many, many traits, and there's diversity and variety, but no select advantage. But if suddenly there was a dramatic change in the, popu in the environment, then one part of that population might suddenly do much better. So that would be an, ex an example of an exaptation. Diversity and variety that doesn't give an advantage, but then some environmental change causes one of the traits in the population to be a huge advantage. So here's an example of an exaptation for humans. The vertebrate skull is built from many different pieces, and this is just a product of the way it evolved. It started as different bones that were put together in different parts to make the surrounding the protection for the nervous system. And so in all organisms, we have these sutures that are the boundaries between the different bones that make up the skull. And in most organisms, that's not really an advantage. It's not good or bad. It's just the way that those organisms are put together. So a chicken hatching out of an egg doesn't get an advantage because its skull is, is put together from many different pieces. However, among humans, it has provided a huge advantage. So this is an example showing, or emphasizing the sutures in the human skull. And when humans are first born, they have a flexibility. These sutures are not completely uh, formed together, and there's even actually an open space called the fontanelle at the back of the head. And this provides an advantage for humans because it has allowed our brains to evolve and get larger and larger and larger and push the limits of that constraint. So we've actually gone beyond the constraint of where we would be able to grow if our skull was made from one big solid piece. And oftentimes, especially after a particularly strenuous birth, human babies are born with a head, sometimes called a cone head. It's deformed a little bit. Most of the time that kind of settles back down and goes into place. And by the time babies get to be about one and a half or two years old, their bones have fused together and their skull is really hard and set around. So this idea of the skull being put together from multiple pieces and being sutured together later on is an example of an acceptation. In our ancestors, it wasn't an advantage because the birth canal was very wide compared to the size of the hole, and and uh, babies were able to be born very easily, and the, the head size was not a constraint. But in humans, as there's been selection for our brains to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and for us to be smarter and smarter, that's provided a limit. Now, we are at kind of that constraint, or at least have been in the past, right? Where we'd kind of pushed human heads to be as big as they could and still fit through the birth canal. And in fact, in the past, many mothers and babies went through huge amounts of stress and um, oftentimes would even die during birth. But recently, just over the last maybe five, maybe even less than that, maybe two, three generations, we've eliminated much of that constraint. So if today a baby's bed, head is too big for the mother's birth canal, we do a C-section, and that has removed that. And so potentially, if there's still natural selection for humans to get bigger and bigger heads, then maybe over the next 1,000, 2,000 years, we would see an increase in the average size of humans' heads, maybe even to the point where it was difficult for mothers to give birth naturally. That is potentially what we could do if we keep this environmental condition to mean that it's no longer necessary to push the baby's head through the birth canal. Now, that would, again, rely on there being some sort of a pressure or advantage to having bigger and bigger heads. And whether or not that's still there, whether we've kind of maxed that out, that's that's debatable, and I don't know that we have much evidence on that. But that's the example of an acceptation. Okay, quick reminder, you have a quiz that you will need to take. It will be over yesterday's, Tuesday's material, and today's, Wednesday's material. So that is 2.2 and 2.3. That quiz will be available all day today on Wednesday, July 24th, and will be available until midnight tomorrow, July 25th, but it will only be over Unit 2.2 and 2.3.